We talked about 10 signs that make you a bad driver, let's talk about 10 signs that make you a good driver. If you haven't seen the opposite video to this one, make sure to check it out at the end of this video. Anyways, let's get started. Always using turn signals and changing lanes early. Now legally, you're supposed to signal around 200 feet according to our driver's test, which seems like a good rule of thumb on the highway, but locally, I don't have any complaints if you do it around 50 to 100 feet, which is about on average 3 to 7 car lengths. So signaling too early, so like 300, 400, or even like half a mile, that's ridiculous because then people just think you left your blinker on. And if you're in a local road where many turns come up, they don't know which turn you're going to take. So that's not a good thing to do. Signaling last second, however, is equally as stupid as it's almost as if the person thinks that they're now legally excused to be a jerk and shove themselves into your lane just because they had their signal on for 0.1 seconds with just a small flash of yellow. The most important thing about using turn signals is that you're supposed to communicate to other people about what you're about to do and you have to give ample time. Now, the second sign that makes you a really good driver that this is one of my personal favorites because very few people know this and very few people also have to do this, but people in slower vehicles, especially commercial vehicles like semis or pickup trucks that have to do towing and whatnot, if you're on a dotted yellow lane for the sake of visibility, I really appreciate it when you guys go a little bit to the right. So obviously when it's solid yellow, they ride just normally and legally we're not allowed to pass them and that's extremely dangerous I don't encourage that however people who drive these commercial vehicles especially semis and large pickups know that their vehicles are huge but also not exactly the fastest they also know that because their vehicles are huge they take up a lot of visibility and make it hard for people to judge a overtake so whenever a dotted yellow shows up I've noticed over the years about 60% of them like more than just a little over half that I've encountered over the years do actually do this thing where they move about like one or two feet even to the right like almost to the shoulder that way I can see who is actually on the oncoming lane and whether or not I can judge an overtake or not. That is a very selfless way of driving and an extremely efficient way of driving because it helps people behind you finally overtake you just in case they have somewhere to be. And I do appreciate semi drivers as well as pickup owners who are self aware of their vehicles whenever dotted yellows show up. Another sign that you're a great driver is when you use hand signals. Now thankfully in the United States and many other countries in the world, hand signals are not banned. Unfortunately, some countries like Australia do have them banned because the lawmakers there are really stupid. So hand signals, not just for literally signaling, but also for all the traffic warnings you can do with them, are still one of the most effective and safe ways to communicate with other drivers. I still use them, everyone around me still uses them, unless there comes a day where we have like a public server that automatically makes every local driver near each other, join it, and then we can broadcast and literally talk to each other. In fact, on second thought, don't ever do that because that completely destroys the privacy and point of being in our own vehicle and also those broadcasts would get super toxic really quick thing. So that's why we just use hand signals instead. Because when it comes to talking, obviously we don't all have radios where we're on the same CB network for Citizens Band. We also cannot communicate by actually trying to shout at each other because of all the wind noise, exhaust noise, and our differing speeds. But hand signals, no matter the speed, sound, or whatever, just give a a quick, very precise, calculated, hey, this is what's going on. Whether it's signaling someone to merge, whether it's waving traffic to go, or even warning people of his sudden stops, I absolutely appreciate hand signals. Just remember to not be overly nice. For example, it's nonsensical to wave someone to go on a two-lane road because you can only effectively stop one of those lanes, not both. The fourth sign you're a good driver is using slow car pull-offs. Just like the second entry on this list, this is a very niche entry, but something that you may encounter later in life or is very specific to people who live in a certain region. A good driver, of course, is prepared for everything and will learn everything, which is why I'm still putting it in this video. If you live in a very mountainous region in the world, for example, where I am in Georgia, you will notice that there are tons of slow car pull-offs. They're literally labeled as slow car pull-offs, and they are meant for people to overtake you and for you to use them in order for people to overtake you. During the autumn season when we start to have leaves falling, we have a certain, we call people leaf gazers, that's the uh, terminology we use to describe people who are just going through the mountains as slow as possible to just look at the changing colors of leaves. Now the problem is these people literally drive less than half or about half of the posted speed, which as you can imagine is extremely annoying. Now a lot of these roads are actually still commercial roads where people like, like UPS trucks and other FedEx delivery services have to go down. So 
so when you're going half the posted speed limit, you are absolutely holding people up from doing their work. You need to just pull off and enjoy the autumn scenery just as a hiker, or if you do rejoin, make sure you pull off again when you're holding someone up again. If you look back and you're seeing like literally 10 or so people, you're doing a terrible job and you need to go. For the people who do use these whenever they get the chance, I appreciate it hugely, and that absolutely is a very good skill to develop because you shouldn't turn it about ego or become territorial because like I said, some of these people are just trying to get to work, so let them get to work. Another fantastic sign that you're a good driver is sharing the road with motorcycles and cyclists. 90% if not more of cyclists and motorcyclists are actually law-abiding citizens who ride perfectly fine. The few times in your life you've been spited by one is not justification to literally take their life. I'll see the nicest Christian mom with coexist stickers all over her rear bumper, but they literally become a demon and yell profanities at a rider who is just trying to go to work just because because that dude is, I don't know, too close to her car or whatever, or they're still doing something legal, but for some reason it just upsets them. I, you literally see the nicest of people turn into monsters the moment a cyclist or motorcyclist shows up for no reason. You're in a multi-thousand pound vehicle compared to them. This is another human being. Even if they're doing something stupid, that doesn't give you the right to literally attempt to take away their life. For the same reason when I encounter bad drivers on the road constantly weaving through, I let it go. I just let them pass. I don't know what their day is. I don't know what their problem is it's not worth getting myself mixed up in their problems. I do the same thing with motorcyclists. Just share the road and pay attention and appreciate the 90% of them who do follow the laws. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of true of cars too. 10% of car drivers suck. The only difference is with cars, we don't notice it as much because there's tons of cars in the United States. Whereas with motorcycles and cyclists, you can hold a vendetta against them because they're a lot more noticeable on the road because there's less of them. And I really hate that that's how easy psychology is to manipulate with humans. The sixth sign that you're a fantastic driver is when you park between lines. I already wasted a ton of time on the previous entry, so I'm not going to do that for this entry because the entry's name literally says what the habit of a good driver is. Yeah, park between lines. Moving on. Leaving distance between vehicles. It is a law to give ample space between vehicles. About half a car minimum at traffic lights and up to two cars in local traffic and three or more on the highway. We are taught that in driver's ed. If you do not follow those, you will be deemed at fault if an accident occurs and you rear end someone because you are tailgating them. Now the problem with big cities is the moment you're in bumper to bumper traffic, you tend to obviously be less than a car with each other. And if you are one or even two cars apart from someone, people see that as an invitation to jump into your lane. As Mythbusters has proved, you maybe get 30 seconds faster to your destination from constantly changing lanes versus just sitting in one lane. And usually I don't advocate for sitting in a lane, but in this particular instance where every single lane, including the passing lane, is stuck in bumper to bumper traffic because they're literally sandwiched in downtown rush hour and everyone's only going 15 miles an hour anyway, sitting in a lane is acceptable for that sense because you all are so tightly packed together, it is actually safer to hold your lane until you need to exit so you're not causing a disturbance for everyone and actually making it worse for them while barely making it better for yourself. Another sign that you're a great driver is actually knowing what street signs mean. Now most driver's tests will test us on all of our street signs. Now I don't know how some people actually pass driver's tests and still don't know what yield signs mean. If you're someone who sees a sign on a road and you have no idea what it means and you've just been ignoring what it means until now and just default treat it like a stop sign, that's a sign that you should probably research signs. It's not a good idea to just assume being slower is always better or in this case, even coming to a full stop. I still see people who do full stops at green lights. I still see people who do full stops at roundabouts. I see people do full stops at yield signs. Those are not situations to do full stops, and those sudden stops can result in rear ending or car pileups. So please do your part as a driver and actually know what it means. Now, the second to last entry for this video is knowing your vehicle. Knowing your car inherently leads to being a good driver. Knowing its size, knowing its braking ability, knowing its acceleration capability, and so on and so forth. This is especially important for winter driving, as if you know how your car accelerates, whether it's all-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, or front-wheel drive, you know how it distributes weight and how it climbs up certain hills when it's snowy or icy, and knowing its brakes and when the failure point is or when the bite point is and so on and so forth, and knowing the amount of level 
level of brake application and pressure you need to use can also save you from getting stuck in an intersection because you panic braked. I just realized that the next entry is basically going to be more of this current entry because knowing your vehicle is a spiraling effect where it can spawn into many good habits, but not knowing your vehicle can spawn into many bad habits. You'll see what I mean with the next entry. This is the final entry of this video, and that is a good driver never panics during an emergency. Now, the problem with failing an emergency is sometimes it can even lead to death depending on how severe it was. And it's really terrible to only have one chance at something in your life, and that one chance can potentially be the last chance. But most people do not learn until they've had that chance. But in my opinion, in this video, I'm going to advocate ahead of time that you try to train yourself to not panic in emergency. The first step is the previous one I've mentioned. You gotta know your vehicle. Let me ask you guys a very honest question. How many of you guys actually know how your vehicle behaves during hard braking and in every weather circumstance too? Most people will say they don't know until the moment they finally need it, they experience what it is. The problem is when you learn on the moment that it happens, like I said, you have such a split second reaction to do it right out of sheer luck or do it wrong and get your vehicle destroyed or even worse, get yourself injured. This is why you need to know your car beforehand and even practice stressful situations in a simulated environment instead of waiting for it to happen last second where literally everything can be lost. More driver ed classes need to teach this. If you are a parent, you can just teach your kid yourself. You don't have to spend money on driver's ed. My father took me to an abandoned parking lot behind a school that was no longer being used to teach me how to drive. Parking lot was pretty ample size. I could get up to 40 miles an hour and there was literally nothing for me to run into unless I tried to run into those things. Everyone needs to know how much input is too much input or what overcorrecting feels like. It can happen both on hard acceleration and hard braking. And overcorrecting will result in a spin out if you panic. Slightly controlling your input and having steady hands especially are the key to preparing for the worst. Use your handbrake and emergency brake. If you've never used your handbrake before, practice it in a parking lot just to see what it feels like because it will jar you a bit because it does not brake your car normally like your regular brake does. Don't let yourself find out what your emergency brake does literally at the point of emergency. Learn how to use your emergency brake before the emergency a few times so when it finally does happen, you don't freak out from it suddenly making your car slide around or shaking your steering wheel and so on and so forth. Honestly, me talking about how not to panic in emergency, that's a whole video to itself about all the different circumstances that you could come across during an emergency and how to react to them. So I'm actually just gonna shut up here and end the video right here. Anyways, if you enjoy automotive content, then make sure to subscribe and like this video for weekly on motive uploads. Check out some of my other videos if you haven't already and see y'all next time. Bladed Angel out.